Hi friends! Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be a follow-up to last week's video where I shared my fountain pen collection and I had mentioned that I was going to talk about how I've been managing my fountain pen collection hobby as someone with ADHD who tends to get very intense and very excited about hobbies that I'm interested in. I received so many lovely comments in my last video where I shared my fountain pen collection and I just love how passionate people are in this fountain pen stationery community and it is such a joy to be able to contribute to the conversation. So thank you for your engagement and I read all of the comments and I also try to respond to all of them. So I'm just having a lot of fun learning about each of you and your preferences when it comes to this amazing fountain pen hobby. Quick Inco Rimo update. So we are in week three of February already. I can't believe it, which means that I have mailed off another seven letters. I'd also like to invite you to grab a tea, coffee, or your favorite cozy beverage. This is a fun tea that I found at the grocery store. This one is a chocolatey peppermint herbal tea winter edition, and I thought the packaging was really adorable and I also happen to love chocolate and peppermint. I've been enjoying this tea very much. I'd also like to invite you to grab your planner or journal and get cozy. <laughs> Basically just do what you need to do to get cozy while we hang out and chat about managing hobbies. All right, to keep myself company, I'm gonna do a little bit of decorating and some work into a few new inserts that I've been kind of chipping away at in my spare time. And I promise there is some relevance to today's topic. I thought we would work on this while we talk. A few years ago, a few friends and I started this thing called Crafternoons, where we would gather together on like a zoom hangout and bring some craft that we were working on whether that was crochet or knitting or whatever you felt like doing and we would just catch up while we would work on whatever we felt like working on so i'd like to bring that spirit into these conversations before i get into sharing what i've learned about adhd with respect to hobbies and the strategies that I've come up with. I did want to emphasize that this is my personal journey and I know it's not going to look the same for everyone. So I really want this to come from a non-judgmental place as much as I want to limit judgment on myself for my own behaviors and my own way of engaging in my different stationary hobbies. I'd also like to extend that non-judgmental perspective to anyone else who is in this hobby. So we're not here to judge you for however you like to engage with any of the hobbies that you are taking part in. And I think part of the reason why I I'm even adding that disclaimer in the first place is because I catch myself all the time judging myself and second guessing how I engage with my hobbies. I've mentioned this several times on my channel, but I've had a lot of different hobbies in the past. And when I get into a hobby, I tend to be really intense when I find something that I'm, I get really excited about. And I used to have a lot of shame around that and that's just not helpful. So what is helpful is asking myself, is there a problem? And thinking about at what point will this hobby that I'm getting into evolve from being fun and joyful to stressful and problematic? 
and what is problematic is going to look different for everyone. For me, when I look at some of my past hobbies and where I got into trouble, I think of hobbies like fiber art, where I was making a lot of wall hangings off of a, a loom. And during that time, I accumulated an obscene amount of yarn and we ended up having to build additional storage just to support all of the yarn that I accumulated in a very short amount of time. So my hobbies become a problem when I have to start adjusting my space in order to accommodate all of the extra things that I'm bringing into my home to sustain that hobby. And it also becomes problematic when I feel like I have so many things that I lose track of what I have accumulated and therefore always feel a little bit guilty that I'm in a way like not giving enough of my attention to the things that I have brought into my home. And when I get into a hobby, like I said earlier, I get really into it. I will go into a research frenzy and I will buy all the associated accessories and things that go along with that particular hobby. It becomes even more of a problem if I eventually lose interest in the hobby. I've kind of realized that sometimes, depending on the hobby, especially when it's new to me, it's best to stay in the shallow end of the pool rather than venturing off into the deep end. Until I determine that whatever the hobby is, is more than just a phase. And I would say journaling is a great example of that where I got really into stationery and journaling when I was a kid and I have consistently kept a journal in my life for the majority of my life. And I've been writing letters to friends since I was in elementary school as well. It's just something that I never quite grew out of. So maybe the materials that I use to write in my journals or write letters to friends have changed and evolved as I have grown up. But the hobby of letter writing or the hobby of journaling has stayed consistent in my life. Okay, so how might my ADHD play a role in how I engage with hobbies? Like one feature characteristic of ADHD is impulsivity, which can be described as behaviors that favor immediate rewards without consideration of long-term consequences or an ability to delay gratification. And I took that directly out of the DSM-5 as one of the criteria that is used to diagnose ADHD. In adults, this can show up in the form of impulse spending <laughs> or constantly engaging in preferred activities without recognizing the risk or consequences of doing so. So I don't know about you, but that really resonated with me because when I really get into a hobby, if I'm not careful, I can definitely spend a lot of money really quickly. Another feature that is referenced pretty often, even though it's not currently like an official criteria that is considered part of formal like a formal ADHD diagnosis is hyperfocus. I found this working definition of hyperfocus, which I thought encompassed my understanding of it pretty well. And that is a state of heightened intense focus of any duration, which most likely occurs during activities related to one's school, hobbies, or screen time, like television, computer, so think like binging. <laughs> this state may include the following qualities, timelessness, failure to attend to the world, ignoring personal needs, having difficulty stopping or switching away from the task, 
feelings of complete engrossment in the task and also feeling really stuck on the small details. So I don't know about you, but I'm kind of done feeling ashamed of my intensity and how I hyper-focus with my hobbies. And that was a really important mindset shift for me to go from feeling shame over the fact that I get this way when I get really excited about a hobby and really accepting it and working with that personality quirk about myself and adapting my behavior towards how I interact with those hobbies from a place of acceptance and intention. So that's why when I came across acceptance and commitment therapy as an approach that has been found to manage impulse control and other ADHD symptoms, I wanted to learn more about it. And so ACT makes use of mindfulness, awareness, and overall acceptance of impulse urges or feelings to improve a person's ability to be more flexible with the way they respond to impulse urges overall. I like it because it focuses less on trying to change your thoughts and feelings and is more focused on accepting them and being flexible about how you respond to them given your own personal values and goals. So I'm not going to spend too, too much time diving into the ins and outs of ACT because I'm not an expert in it. It's just something that I came across in my research that I found really resonated with me and I thought made a lot of sense to me given my own history and my relationship with how I engage in hobbies. The general idea is that these components work together to allow a person to essentially accept their behavior, in my case, the way I engage with hobbies, detach myself from unhelpful thoughts around it, be more mindful or present with myself and when I'm engaging in the hobby, thinking about how these behaviors fit in with my overall values as a person and then committing to action or goals that are aligned with those values. So if I wanted to apply this to my hobbies, I could think of this like I'm going to embrace the fact that I get passionate and excited about new hobbies and I know it's inevitable that I'm going to hit that hyper focus stage and recognize that it's the discovery, creativity, and experimentation phase of new hobbies that really bring me a lot of joy. And it also allows me to reframe my narrative. I might have a thought like, I I can't control my impulse to collect things um, or accumulate things when I get into a new hobby because I struggle with hyperfocus and I have ADHD. And what I like about this detachment of unhelpful thoughts is I can say to myself, well, you know, that's just me trying to convince myself I have no control. It's actually not a fact that I have no control and I can think of several ways that I do. So this is a thought and this isn't a fact or this isn't like a defining feature of me. And There are plenty of ways that I can be present with my hobby that doesn't include adding more things or always searching for the next thing that will level up my engagement with the hobby. There are a lot of creative ways that I can experiment and stay interested in it without having to always think about the next thing. In terms of things that I value personally, that's sustainability, function, variety. I don't really know if that's a, a value, but I like, I like variety, <laughs> quality, and mindful consumption. So the part about ACT that I'm going to focus on is the committed action part. So I've, I've spent some time in the past talking about self-compassion and acceptance, and I, I think 
I'm slowly getting better at that. I'm actually seeing some personal growth in that area where I'm working a lot harder at having self compassion and just generally being a lot more accepting of how I behave, especially when it comes to hobbies that I'm really excited about. At this point, I know that I'm going to get really excited. I'm going to do a ton of research and I'm probably going to want to experiment um, and try a few different things before I start to calm down and get to a point where I know what I like and what I don't. So when it comes to applying my values towards my hobby, some of the strategies or actions that I have committed to are, for example, with sustainability, I've been focusing on finding pens that really have that long-term potential. So I mentioned this in my previous video, but I tend to favor neutral or classic looking pens because even though they're not as maybe flashy or shiny as some of the really pretty pens that have caught my eye recently. But I know there's a chance that I will get sick of them or I might grow out of the phase of finding them really exciting because even if in that moment I couldn't ever see that happening, I've seen it happen too many times at this point and I know that is something to think about or to watch out for. So my response to that has been aiming for solid color pens. I know that I really love like the gold trim and this pen is a perfect example of one that I pick up and look at every day and I just feel calm when I see it. So that is an example of finding a pen with very long-term potential. And that is how I am attempting to honor my value of sustainability because instead of buying a bunch of new pens, I'm really trying to focus on pens that I don't mind using again and again and again, I don't get bored of, and that allow me to not accumulate too many. Another value that I mentioned was function. And for me, that means sticking with pens that make sense for my needs. At this point, I know that I need to stick with pens that I can use in my everyday life. So not necessarily as something that I just pull out for like special occasions. So for me, that looks like a pen that I know will work with a variety of different papers and will also support my start and stop pattern of taking notes. So that's why in my last video, I went on and on about the vanishing point because this pen is just so functional for me that it's hard for me to look at other pens and think that I would use that on a daily basis, knowing my own usage patterns. Once I figured that out for myself, it just made it a lot easier for me to be able to say no to other types of pens. Because for me, it's never as simple as like good pen, bad pen. So I have to go a step farther and think, what am I realistically going to use and enjoy on a regular basis instead of just for special occasions? And the type of work I do does require me to do a lot of hand written notes. So it's extremely important to me that whatever pen I'm using is something that I can grab and reach for, for my daily use, not just my like special, not just for like special use. Variety is a really interesting one. I don't know if this word really makes the most sense, but to me, I get bored really easily. And I know this about myself. And in order for me to stay engaged with something, I try to ensure that it has some aspect of variety. Some actions I take to ensure that I am getting that variety are 
intentionally taking breaks from my hobby. So because I know that I can kind of get very like hyper focused in it, I will set limits and I will also diversify my hobbies. So every day I try to do something creative as part of my self care plan. Some nights that might be playing around with my inks and pens, but other times it might be picking up my crochet hook and working on my latest crochet project. That way I'm not necessarily getting too focused on any one project. So for example, this became my hyper focus project last year for probably about a month and a half. And I basically spent every single moment that I wasn't working, working on this sweater. And that meant I was neglecting some of my cooking duties, which I don't do anymore. It meant sometimes I wasn't even making plans to go and be social because I was trying so hard to finish this sweater in my spare time. I was also staying up really late just to finish like another row of crochet. That is an example of where it became a problem. And for me, I find it really hard to stop until the project is actually finished. I finished this sweater and I love it, but when I wear it and look at it, I actually can't help but think about all those sleepless nights, the, my lack of social life, and probably way too much takeout because I was neglecting my cooking duties and all of that was falling on Mike, or we were ordering a lot of takeout. And while my work wasn't exactly suffering, it basically meant I was working and then I was crocheting, and that was kind of my life for a month and a half. And that was not healthy. I think that was probably one of the last times I really allowed myself to get super hyper focused on one hobby. And since then, I've really tried to limit myself and ensure that whatever I'm doing, I'm taking breaks and I'm, I'm diversifying. Another one of my values is quality. So one of my committed actions is I stick to brands that I like and I am a little wary of too much experimentation. So in my last video, I touched on my first set of pens that I considered part of my experimentation phase where I bought a few different pens in different nib sizes. I bought a few Western nibs, a few Japanese nibs. And once I realized what my preference was, I exited the experimentation phase as quickly as possible. So once I discovered that I preferred Japanese nibs and then I discovered that I really loved the Pilot nib for everyday use, like everyday note-taking use. And I preferred the Sailors for that mechanical pencil, long form writing use. I narrowed down the nib sizes I wanted. I purchased my pens and I tried to pick very neutral colors that I felt I would love for a long time. And then I just stopped. And I know there are plenty of other brands that I am missing out on. I'm positive that there are more that I would love, but if I venture out and re-enter that experimentation phase, I just know that it's going to lead to continued experimentation and consumption. And I have to constantly remind myself that I have enough. And I have enough pens and I have plenty of ink bottles and ink samples to keep me entertained for a very long time. The last value that I wanted to talk about is mindful consumption. There are a couple of things that I'm doing in, in regard to this. So one is I'm identifying and I'm limiting my triggers. I know that when I browse Instagram, I don't have Instagram anymore, but I used to have Instagram. And whenever I would browse Instagram, I would get this urge to buy some new stationery or buy it or buy a new pen or try out some new ink. So now I really limit the amount of pen and ink content that I consume on social media. 
I try not to frequent my local pen shops too often and that includes Wonder Pens which is still my favorite stationery store and I will always support them as much as I can if I am planning on making a stationery purchase. But knowing that I struggle with impulse control once I'm in in a physical store, especially one as beautifully curated as theirs, I try to limit how often I actually go. And a great example is this Pilot Metropolitan, which I talked about in my last video, where if I had seen this pen online, I don't think I would have been tempted to purchase it. But when I was in the store and they recommended it to me and I got to try it out in the store, I just fell in love with the writing experience and took it home. Not that that's a problem because it did support my experimentation phase and it taught me a lot about my preferences for Japanese style nibs. But it's also a reminder for me that I pretty much can't go to Wonder Pens without buying something. So, you know, when I see a shiny pen on YouTube or Instagram, of course I get tempted to add it to my collection. And I have three pens already that I would love to add to my collection, but I've just decided not to give in to that temptation or that impulse because it doesn't align with my values of function, um, sustainability, and quality. Two of those pens are actually uh, Western nibs and I already know that I prefer Japanese nibs and while it may seem silly to completely write off a whole style of nibs. It's also, I guess, a protective type of action where I just don't want to go down that rabbit hole. And so it's easier for me to set some parameters like that and use them to help me regulate my impulsive behavior. And then the last thing that I have been thinking about or that I've been trying to do in terms of being more mindful with my consumption is I've been trying to cherish my pens and date them <laughs> and and sort of go on more dates with my pens. So I've been trying to come up with creative ways to really enjoy and cherish those pens and one of those ways is this ink log journal project. So I have a pen log and I have an ink log and they're both using inserts that I already had. So this is a blank Midori insert that comes with the Traveler's Notebooks. And then this is a Galen leather Tomoe River paper insert that I got in a pack of three last year. And I've been using one of these as my everyday to-do list in my regular Traveler's Notebook. But I'm not a huge fan of it being a blank notebook. And so I was trying to think of other ways that I could use my remaining inserts that didn't involve like everyday use. I've been really enjoying setting this up. So I've just been taking my time with it. I'm not in any rush to get it all done, but basically I've been dedicating a few pages to each of the pens that I already have in my collection. So for example, this is for my Kaveco Sport, which is the first fountain pen that I ever bought for myself. And it's the Macchiato one, which is in my wallet right now, but I've been trying to sketch these out very loosely. They're not meant to be like perfect sketches. I've been sketching out the pens on the side. My plan is to color them in in some way, so either with watercolor or marker or ink. I haven't really decided which is why it's still in pencil but this page is gonna be the sketch of the pen and then information about it. So I've been brainstorming what information I'd wanna capture and I have like brand, the name, the color way of the pen, the nib size, the date I acquired it, how much it cost me, just general notes about the usage of the pen over time. 
And then on the right side, and I've left a few pages for this, my intention is to document the brand of the ink and the ink color. And I only started this insert this year in January, so it, it doesn't have like all the inks I've ever inked these pens up with, but anything since I started this project is in this book. So I have like, I've sketched out my Lamy, uh, my Metropolitan, and then of course my vanishing points. So since I started this project, I've inked my vanishing point with two different colors. And I think I've just been having a lot of fun keeping track of them. So my plan is to continue on with this project. And the idea is that I'm creating a sense of experimentation by documenting the different inks and seeing how they behave in different pens. I'm also allowing myself to really like revisit all of these pens and really spend more time with them and create more engagement with them. My intention here is to keep myself interested so that I've got something to look forward to and something to log that are a little more aligned with my values than acquiring a new shiny pen and getting excited about that. I'm really just trying to continually create interest by coming up with fun ways to engage with these pens and to really use them. So I think this insert is actually gonna be really fun when I continue working through it, but it's kind of like a side project. It's not something that I want to hyper focus on and go crazy trying to finish it all up at once. Uh, so for now, when I ink up the pen, I'm adding it here and then eventually I will add the information on the side and maybe add some notes when I feel like documenting some pen thoughts about each of these different pens. I'm looking forward to getting to know each of my pens even more than I already do and making note of different inks that I really enjoy using in them. So because I have a lot more ink samples than I do full bottles of ink, by trying out my samples in different pens, if it turns out that I come across an ink that I really love, then that's another way for me to slow down the decision process if I did want to make the decision to purchase the ink at a future date. So that's really all that I had prepared for you today. If you're a fountain pen collector, I'm curious to know how you manage your collection and what some of your goals and values are when it comes to building and maintaining your fountain pen collection. And if you have ADHD, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on using something like acceptance and commitment to help manage your hyper-focused tendencies or hobbies. And if not, what do you think is more helpful for you when it comes to en engaging in hobbies in general? If you're still here, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I appreciate you so much, and I will see you soon in the next video. Bye!